All right. I know if you have a bu- uh, bulletin, it says that I'm going to be preaching in Second Chronicles today. And that was what my original plan was, but it's not apparently God's plan. I had every intention of preaching that sermon when the bulletin went to print, but God said, no, we're doing something different today, and so we're actually going to be in Isaiah chapter 53. I would say that I, I uh, can count on one hand probably the number of times in my ministry that the sermon has actually gone to print in the bulletin, and then I have changed it. But every once in a while, God says, we're doing something different. And I've learned that it's a good idea to listen to him. So that's what I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna do today. Isaiah chapter 53 is where we'll be. I'll give you just a second to find your your place there. All right, Isaiah chapter 53, beginning with verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was He has put him to grief, and when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I'd like to talk to you about heroes today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I come to you today, Lord, and I just come humbly before your throne asking you, Lord, to speak to me and to speak through me, God. Lord, this is your sermon, and you gave it to me, and I'm giving it back to you now. Lord, you evidently wanted it preached today, so I'm, I'm giving it to you, and I'm asking you, Lord, to pour out your Holy Spirit today. I'm praying that you would use this sermon to accomplish your purpose today, Lord, that you'd speak to me, speak to us, Lord. God, I pray that you would show us Jesus today. Hide me behind the cross, I pray. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, the amazing thing about Isaiah chapter 53, it, it's not hard to tell when you read it that it's a prophecy about Jesus. What, what is amazing to me is that it's a prophecy that was given several hundred years before Jesus was ever born, and it's amazingly accurate. I'm sort of returning to my roots today, I guess. The very first sermon I ever preached was on Isaiah 53. Now, this isn't the first, I'm not, I'm not rehashing the first sermon I ever preached. Uh, hopefully, I've grown a little bit since then. But this was the first sermon I ever preached because it spoke to me in a very profound way. 
When I think about heroes, my mind goes back to my high school days. It seems like when I was in high school, I was always looking for a hero and always ending up with the wrong ones. High school is a, is a, weird, is a weird time. I mean, it, 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 it really is. I, I pray for you teenagers. It's a rough, a rough go around, I'll tell you. Um, and anybody that tries to tell you that these are the best years of your life, you don't believe them. They're lying to you. It's, it's not. It, it really, it's, it's going to get better. Hang on for these four years. It'll get better after this, I, I promise you. But when I was in high school, I, I was not really sure. I was always looking for somebody to be like. Always looking for somebody to try to pattern my life after. The world is full of heroes, and, and most of the heroes that we have are the wrong kind of heroes. And I, I spent my life as a teenager with the wrong idea of what a hero was supposed to be. Seems like I, I was always unsure of who I was and always trying to find somebody to be like them. And I, I began to look when I, when I got into high school at what, what should my life look like. Who should my heroes be? And of course, the first people that caught my eye were the popular kids. I looked at the kids who were cool and the kids who were popular, and I tried to be like them. Now, I, I, I've got to say this, because <laughs> you can probably tell by looking, I never was like them. But I tried to be like them. I wanted to be like them. I walked like they did. I talked like they did. I dressed like they did. Even to the point of getting this goofy felt hat that looked like I was a mafia member or something, and these weird dark sunglasses, and that's what I wore around town was the you know for about two years when I was about fifteen or sixteen years old. And no, I'm not. That's not you know, the skinny jeans was enough of a prank. If you get me a goofy hat and glasses, I'm not wearing them to preach in. But I did wear them as a teenager, and I'm I'm kind of embarrassed and ashamed to say that. But that's how badly I wanted to be cool and fit in and, and, and to be accepted. But God taught me a couple of things early on. First of all, He taught me that I'm not cool. <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of the best lessons God ever taught me in life is that I'm not cool. I'm valued. I'm important. I'm significant but I'm not cool. And young people and old people both, I would say the quicker you learn that lesson about yourself, the happier you'll be. You're not cool, so don't try to be. Be who you are in Christ. I watched, I watched the popular people in my high school. The cool people were the ones that always had friends. Cool people... Always had friends, and I wanted friends. I wanted people to like me. You know, I still do. I, I, I never outgrew that. I always, I still to this day want friends and want people to like me. If somebody doesn't like me, it bothers me. Lisa said, you shouldn't, you shouldn't let that get to you. But, but I, I still, I've never outgrown that. I still want people to like me. And I saw that cool people had friends, and I saw that People that weren't cool or weren't considered cool by the in crowd, they're the ones that got laughed at. Now, I realized a couple more things. I realized, first of all, if Jesus had gone to my high school, we'd have laughed at him. Now, I'm not kidding you. If Jesus would have showed up at my high school, we'd have laughed at him. Look at Isaiah chapter uh, 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men. Now, this is the prophet talking about Jesus, the coming Messiah, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Nobody looked at Jesus and thought, oh, he's cool. He was, he was the one that if he showed up at your high school, the kids would have laughed at him. I learned one other thing. I, I learned that you can be cool, or, or you can be genuine, but you can't be both. So you have to decide. 
Young people, old people, you have to decide which do you want to be. You can either be cool or you can be genuine. You can be real. But you can't be both. People wanted to be like the cool kids, but when they needed the answers to life's questions, the cool kids had no answers to give. That's what I found. I found that everybody wanted to be like the cool kids, but, but when, when life hit, the cool kids had no answer because there was no real substance there. Then I realized something. It took me a little bit. I had to get past teenage years a few years, but I, but I began to realize something. I realized that a cool kid is a scared kid because he knows it's all just an act. There's nothing of, of, of real substance driving it. It's all an act. He lives in fear that, that someone will find out that there's no real substance. And do you know there's adults that way today? It's all just an act. It's not real. It's all just pretend. Everything, and they, and they live in constant fear that somebody's going to find out that the act isn't real. What a sad way to live. So I, I decided that I, that I needed a new hero. Look into the popular kids, the popular people. That wasn't the answer, so I decided that I needed a new hero. And so I began to look other places, and then I turned my attention to beauty. Now, there's a lot of pretty girls in high school, and so that wasn't a, that wasn't a hard thing for me. to that, that, that turned my head pretty quickly to beauty. I was always attracted to the most beautiful girls in school. Of course, the problem was they were never attracted to me. Right up till the time I met Lisa, in which case, you know, the most beautiful girl was attracted to me. But, but all through high school, it, you know, the, it wasn't the beautiful girls that were attracted to me. I learned quickly in high school that the beautiful girls hang out uh, with the handsome guys. So that kind of left me out of the loop. Uh, and I realized a couple more things. I realized if Jesus would have went to my high school, no girl would have had anything to do with it. You say, oh, surely not. Well, look at verse 2 of Isaiah 53. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Uh, he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, in other words, there's nothing that you would have looked at Jesus when he walked down the street and said, well, there's a handsome man. Men would not have looked at Jesus and said, I wish, you know, that, 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 I, could, that I could look like that physically. I realized that if, if, if Jesus went to my high school, no girl would have had anything to do with him. And I realized something else, that just because somebody's beautiful on the outside doesn't mean they're beautiful on the inside. Now that's a lesson that, 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 that's sometimes takes a little, little while to learn. But I, I would say this to you, if you're, if you're looking for you know, the, 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 the Mr. or Miss Wright for your life, you might want to write that one down. Just because somebody is pretty on the outside doesn't make them pretty on the inside. You know, the most popular kids were also the most uh, handsome and beautiful, it seemed like. And it seemed like they got all the breaks along the way. I don't know if it seemed that way in your school or if you, teenagers, if it seems that way to you now, that it seems like some people get all the breaks. I would say hang in there. It's going gonna, it's gonna to turn one of these days pretty quickly. My senior year, you know, they, for the yearbook, they did these superlative pages. You know, you, you know uh, most popular, uh, most handsome, most likely to succeed. Y'all probably had those too. And so it was always a boy and a girl. So the, the most handsome and the most popular were also uh, the most likely to succeed. The boy and the girl, most li likely to succeed. They were the popular kids. They were the cool kids. They were the ones that everybody wanted to be like, and they were the ones that even the teachers looked at, and they said, boy, they're really going to amount to something with their life. <laughs> I was the one that when, when my teachers heard 
Mark Smith is a preacher. They're going, Mark Smith, how to figure he'd have been in jail by now. Uh, but these kids were the ones that they had everything going for them. The girl that was most li- voted most likely to succeed got a full-ride scholarship to Baylor University. Full-ride. She, I don't believe she ever finished college because she burned herself up on cocaine before she ever got out of college. She's just a shell now of what her life could have been. So much potential down the drain. Most likely to succeed boy had to end up dropping out of college before he ever finished to get married because he became a daddy sooner than he was supposed to. And I began to realize that a lot of the beautiful people are miserable because they're empty on the inside. So I decided I needed a new hero. And so I began to look other places. And I turned my attention to strength. I decided the only thing left for me to do, since I wasn't handsome, and I wasn't cool, and I wasn't popular, the only thing left for me to do was play football. (laughs) I decided that strength was the key to my success, and I'd pour all my efforts into proving my manhood on the football field. Except there was a little problem with that. I was 5'8 and weighed 110 pounds. I don't know how much you know about high school football. 5'8, 110 pounds. Now, I need to tell you something else. I couldn't run, I couldn't throw, and I couldn't catch. So guess where they put me? On the defensive line. (laughs) Now, I don't know. I know y'all have... I know y'all have football in Oklahoma. Uh, Even got a college that tries to play a little college football every now and then. But anyway, uh, in Texas high school football, a 5'8", 110-pound defensive tackle doesn't last too long. So six months and three broken bones later, I learned a couple of things. I learned, first of all, I'm not cut out to play football. I love watching it. I I still think I could have been a great coach as far as the the X's and O's. God didn't make me to play football. I learned that the hard way. I also learned that a lot of people that were strong physically were weak in other ways. Our best football player on on our team in our high school all district, all regional linebacker. I mean, terror, sent a terror in the opposing team. Sent a terror on it. I mean, anybody walked down the hall, you didn't want to cross him, that's for sure. Everybody that played football wanted to be like him. I saw him the night we lost the play, the, the state playoff game. Cry like a baby. The coach had to get up and said, son, you're embarrassing yourself and us, this team, get up. Crying like a little baby, bashing his head into a chain link fence. He died in his early 20s. I have every reason to believe he died lost and is not in heaven today. And I realized that that strength, physical strength, Sometimes is all somebody has. I realized that Jesus wasn't somebody who demonstrated great physical strength on this earth. Now, I'm not saying he was a weakling. If he was, if he worked around the carpenter shop and walked everywhere he went, he was probably in pretty good physical shape. But that wasn't what defined him. If you look in verse four. Surely He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken and smitten by God. Verse 5, He was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of, for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Verse 7, He was oppressed, 
He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. He was led as a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is silent, so He opened not His mouth. Doesn't sound like a picture of physical strength. Doesn't sound like someone that people would look to and say, I want to be like Him. I realize that the strong die, just like everybody else. So strength can't be all that you're about. So I decided I needed a new hero. And I began to think about that. As I got into my early 20s, I I really began to think seriously about that. And I began to think that if the cool were fake, and the beautiful were empty, and the physically strong were spiritually weak, that maybe I should look for a hero that was all the things that they were not. And that's what led me to Jesus. My real hero. And I began to look at Jesus, what a real hero He is. He wasn't cool. He was real. He was genuine. Look what, look what it says in verse 4. Surely He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. In other words, He was doing a great thing and we were too blind to even see it. Wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to His own way and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He suffered for me. Nobody ever did that for me. Nobody ever died for me. I've had, I've had people that were my friends. I've had people that were nice to me. But I've never had anybody die for me. The answer to life is found in the purpose of His coming. All we like sheep have gone astray. We're all sinners, the Bible teaches us. We've turned to our own way, and the Lord laid on Him the iniquity of us all. He died on the cross because I'm a sinner and because you're a sinner. All of us. The pretty and the ugly. The cool and the outcast. Strong and the weak. We're all sinners. He died for every one of us. You can wear your cool hat and your glasses and pretend that you're cool, but at the foot of the cross, it all has to come away and realize, I'm not as cool as I think I am. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. He was strong, but He was strong through demonstrating weakness. He was oppressed, verse 7 says, and afflicted. He opened not His mouth, led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so He opened not His mouth. The cross isn't a symbol of strength. It's a symbol. It's not a symbol of popularity. It's it's a symbol of shame and weakness. He bore our grief. He bore our sorrows. He took all that you were and all all that you might be through Him and switched places with you. He became what you are. He became what you were so that you might become who you are through Him. Nobody ever died for me. I've had real friends, and I've had people that pretended they were my friends for what they thought they could get out of the deal. Some of my worst hurts in life have not come from my enemies, but from people that I thought were my friends. I've had people that have helped me, I've had people that have been good to me, but I've never had anybody die for me except for Jesus. That's a hero. He fills the emptiness in the soul of man. All the things that I couldn't find from earthly heroes, He he fills that emptiness. See, the key is in verse 11. He, talking about the Father, 
shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. This is the, the, the purpose of Jesus Christ. That on the cross, He would bear our iniquities, our sins. And that by knowing Him, the one true hero, you might find peace and forgiveness with God. Jesus is the hero that all other heroes must look to to fill the emptiness in their soul. The cool have to look to Jesus because He's the only one that can fill their emptiness. The strong have to look to Jesus because He's the one that is the source of true strength. The beautiful and the handsome, they have to look to Jesus because anybody that's pretty on the outside but not on the inside just kind of stinks. He's the person that when we realize I'm not cool and I'm not popular, He's the one that says, yes, but you're of infinite value to me. You are significant because of you belong to me. He's the one that we say, I'm really, not, I'm really not handsome or pretty at all. He says, you are to me. Because I'm going to make you pretty on the inside. And pretty on the inside is a whole... Oh, far greater than pretty on the outside. We say, I'm really not strong at all. I'm 5'8", 110 pounds, and there's some fullback that just stepped on my hand and I think he broke it. He says, come on, Mark. You can be strong in me. You can stand behind the pulpit and you can preach my word. And you don't have to apologize to anybody for doing it. Jesus is the hero that all other heroes have to look to because it's only through Him that we find the filling of the emptiness of our soul. <laughs> but you know, in my high school, I found that I wasn't the only one that learned the lesson. It took us a little while. I went back to my hometown. One of those popular kids, he's doing youth ministry now. He didn't look nearly as like he thought he was nearly as cool as he did back in high school. The guy that was most likely to succeed that had to drop out of college, he got saved. He's a deacon in his church now. He went back to school and finally finished it. He's doing good now. But it wasn't until they realized that the answer to what they were looking for was Jesus. See, I always wanted to go back to my hometown. I always wanted to go back to my old high school and tell them I found what I was looking for. Guys, listen, I, I, I found what I was looking for, but God never let me do that. And don't think I hadn't begged God on many occasions, let me go back and just tell Him, but I never had the opportunity to do that. Instead, He said, I'll send you to a place like your hometown. I'll send you to people like the ones from your hometown. To kids like the ones that you went to school with. And here's what I want you to tell them. I want you to tell them I found what I was looking for. And so I, I guess that's my message to you today. Whether you're strong and beautiful and popular or weak and ugly and laughed at, if your friends think you're cool inside, but, uh, but inside all you feel is empty and broken, I just want to tell you I found what you're looking for. Because I found what I was looking for. And His name is Jesus Christ. Do you know Him today? Aside from all of the, the popularity and the coolness and, and, and who's handsome and who's cute and who's going with this one and that one and all that, I want to ask you, young person, old person, teenager, senior citizen, do you know Him today? I promise you, He's what you're looking for. He's the real hero. Let's pray. God, I thank You for Your Word and I thank You for 
the chance to preach it today. And I thank you for Jesus, the only true hero. God, now as we come to this time of invitation, I pray that you would speak to us, touch our hearts, Lord, and lead us to the decisions that you'd have us to make. Lord, it's your time. I pray that you'd do with it what you will. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.